Hello everyone, I'm Sean Byrne. Welcome to my brand new YouTube channel. I'm going to be talking about how I created this Squid Game scene in 3D. So, Squid Game, that wildly popular show on Netflix at the moment. I'm not going to go into what it's about, but I really enjoyed the show and I wanted to do something in 3D. And I decided that the most iconic scene was probably the red light, green light game within the show. Now, I use 3ds Max and Octane Render to create my 3D scenes, but if you are using another 3D suite or render engine, hopefully you'll be able to at least take something away from this video. I'm forever watching Blender videos and Cinema 4D videos because I find learning how other artists approach their scenes is absolutely invaluable to what I do, despite them using other software. Usually that information is translatable or at least give me a bit of inspiration in how I would approach something differently next time. Before you start any 3D scene, it's important to know what you're trying to accomplish. For me, I wanted to create something that was faithful to the original show, but wasn't a carbon copy down to the last grain of sand and arrangement of pebbles on the ground. I knew from the very beginning that I wanted it to be a photorealistic render, and fortunately for me, that is Octane Render's bread and butter being that it is an unbiased render engine. And with that, it was time to start gathering reference. I use a free program called Pure Ref, which allows you to pile all of your reference imagery onto one canvas and get cracking. Reference is vital to creating an accurate depiction of your subject or for inspiration. And there's never a single project where you shouldn't be gathering reference imagery along the way. And that goes for any type of artist, be it digital, 2D, traditional, or 3D. I also took a look around on various model sharing websites for any 3D assets I might be able to use to speed up my workflow. And because of the show's popularity, I managed to find models of the doll and the soldier, which gave me a really good starting point. When you're doing this kind of work, you should never be afraid to use any assets that you can find that are available to you, as long as they're within your personal budget or your client's budget, because it's going to save you a lot of time and let's be honest time is money i also didn't want to give myself any longer than a couple of days to work on this project so deadlines are certainly a factor as well deadlines keep you motivated and they keep you on track if you can always set yourself one your skills will improve as well because you'll learn how to achieve something more efficiently so we're finally ready to start making the thing I started off very simply by bringing in a plane and taking an educated guess at what the scale of the arena would have been in the show. And I guessed around 130 meters squared and I held shift, dragged up the walls to create a 21 meter high wall and that felt right to me. Not that it matters because I'm not going to reveal anything that's behind the camera further into the distance, but it just helps my head get into that space and understand the scale. I then decided it was time to bring in the doll model from Turbo Squid and get the scale of her correct as well. Luckily for us, the main image that we're working from has two people stood right next to her. If we just assume that these people are roughly the height of an average person, which is probably around 170 centimeters, we can see that the doll is just over twice the height of one of these guys. So that gives us a pretty good scale. So we basically times 170 by two, and a little bit more, and we get the scale of the model. And in terms of layout, that is pretty much all we need for this scene, as it is fairly simple. And now we get onto the fun stuff. Taking a closer look at the doll model, I decided I did want to add extra details like moving eyes and a hole for the neck so you can clearly see the join when the head rotates. But the topology wasn't on my side. I attempted to retopologize her using 3ds Max's retopology tools and the UVs reset when you apply a retopology modifier. I did attempt to reproject her texture UVs back onto the new mesh, but I didn't get the results that I wanted. So I decided to keep her original topology and see what I could do. Using poly selection, I toggled on the by angle constraint and selected both of her eyes and deleted them. For the brand new pair of eyes, I brought in a sphere, used a combination of extrude and inset to create a brand new camera lens looking eyeball which then I saved a version of the sphere to create the casing around the eye. And that closely matches our reference. If you're modeling a basic shape like this one and you find that it's looking a little bit too polygonal, once you've defined your smoothing groups, you can drop on a mesh smooth modifier and smooth by smoothing groups. Before working on any materials, I had to light the scene first. So I went over to good old Poly Haven and found a decent HDRI to light the scene. And just by translating the HDRI slightly a few degrees or so, I was able to get the shadows to pretty closely match what they had when they filmed the scene. I am summarizing quite a lot through this tutorial, so if you do want to see a guide to how I usually configure my settings within Octane and 3ds Max, then subscribe and maybe I'll create one in the future. Going back to the eyeball materials, I made sure to apply a spherical UVW matte projection so our textures don't look stretched. I then used three glossy materials to create the main colors of the eye to match our reference. I took a simple roughness map, piped it into a gradient texture, 
and applied it to all three of those glossy shaders to give the eye some subtle surface detail. I enabled rounded edge on all three of those materials. It just helps any sharp edges become a little bit rounder and catch the light ever so slightly, which really helps believability. And while it might sound a little bit OTT in this case, you won't find a completely sheer angle in real life, even the sharpest of objects. So it's good practice to remember that and incorporate that into your renders. For the pupil, I used a specular material and added a scattering node into the medium. I played around with the density, absorption and scattering settings until I got something that I was happy with. I used another specular material for the casing of the eye, but this time I just added the roughness map from the rest of the eye and piped it into a new gradient texture. I made it very subtle because roughness detail becomes a lot more apparent when it's on a specular material, so it doesn't need to be much to give you some detail. And that's it, create a copy and boom, our doll has a fresh pair of eyes. Moving on to the material for the main body now, I was happy with the diffuse color map that the model came with, I performed some minor hue adjustments which aren't even worth covering, and then I began adding surface imperfections. Nothing crazy, but I did want something to catch the light, so I took a black and white texture map of some scratches, plugged that into a gradient to control the subtlety of the scratches, and then into a chaos texture map, which is basically the closest thing Octane has to magic. It takes any texture map you input, it doesn't even have to be seamless, you can make it seamless by changing the coverage value, and makes it so you can't see any repetitions in the final material. Normally you will get that tiled effect, especially if you're doing something like a large surface area like grass, but this chaos texture map changes everything. And then I took a noise map, piped that into a gradient as well. Mixing those together meant I could control just how much detail I got from each texture while making it seem a lot more varied than just say one texture map on its own. Now obviously being black and white maps, I piped those in as bump information, which is less accurate than normal information. But if you keep the effect controlled and subtle, it really really, really helps. Sometimes when you bring in a model from somewhere else, you might notice strange shading like here on this doll's arm. If that's the case, you can drop on an edit normals modifier and reset the normals. You can then apply your own smoothing groups and fix the shading. The final thing I wanted to do to the doll model was add a hole for the neck. At the moment, the neck is completely combined with the head, but in the show, you can clearly see a gap between the neck and the head when the head rotates. Now, while I possibly could have gone the Boolean route for this, I decided to not even entertain it due to the topology of this mesh already being as messy as it is. Instead, I made a rough poly selection around the neck and detached it from the head. Then, using a really handy script called Regularize Edge Loop, which you can find on scriptspot.com, I selected the border of the hole we just made on the head and made it into a perfect circle. With soft selection enabled, this allowed me to regularize the cutout without deforming the shape of the head too much. A little extrude to create the illusion of thickness on the inside, pop the neck back in, and the end result looks pretty good. We're done with the doll, let's move on. For the tree, I brought one in from Forest Pack. I deleted all the leaves so we're left with this horrible, dead tree. But of course there's way too many branches and it's way too tall, so we're going to need to give him a little haircut and turn him into a handsome boyo. I drew a rough selection around the part of the tree that I wanted to keep, inverted my selection, and deleted the remaining branches. It ended up needing a lot of fiddling and repeating the process a few times, but in the end I got something that I was happy with. Then I scoured around online for a high res bark texture. Eventually I found one, I believe I did some tweaking to make it seamless, then generated a normal map, and then, using a grayscale version of the texture piped into a displacement map, I was able to get a really nice Nice final result. Now moving on to the surrounding environment, starting with the ground. I tessellated the ground plane a few times to give us some more geometry to play with, so then I could add a noise modifier and get some subtle height variation. I selected a little area around the tree, detached that from the ground plane, and repeated the process, so I could add a little bit more detail and make it so the tree feels rooted in the ground. Whenever I'm after some quick detailed materials, I often turn to Substance Source, and that is exactly what I did here. 3ds Max these days comes with direct substance integration, whether you decide to load the Substance node manually or send the material directly from Substance Source, you can get these often procedural materials into your scenes to give you a lot of creative freedom. I linked up two of my chosen Substance materials into Octane Glossy Shaders, making sure my RGB and Grayscale image mapping nodes for Octane were set to a gamma of 1. Very important to convert them over to the gamma setup that we are using. Using texture displacement and a lot of playing around, I ended up with a nice base layer of sand and a layer of pebbly soil. Then using a noise modifier, I was able to control how much of each material I got to show through the surface of the ground. To avoid the look of one consistent shade of sand, I used a darker version of the sand material and piped it into a mix material. Then using the black and white values of a noise map, I could tell the mix material where to show patches of light sand and dark sand. But the ground isn't done yet. I decided I needed even more variation for greater realism. So for that, I decided to use Tie Flow. It's an amazing free plugin that basically 
basically completely overhauls 3ds max's native particle flow system what that means in our case is it's going to be really easy to scatter details randomly across the ground i modeled four pebbles of different sizes using a geosphere and taking a noise modifier set to fractal now this isn't a tie flow tutorial so let's keep this brief but basically i said hey tie flow can you create me a new birth event for 15,000 objects can you position them on this ground floor plane can you display this list of items and hey can you make sure they render and make sure they are so random that you can't even tell that they are the same four rocks repeated throughout the whole scene and Tyflo was like yeah man no problem and there we go layering all of those elements together created this really nice detailed ground in the background of our reference I noticed there were some larger stones collecting where the wall meets the ground so I added a small incline with an exaggerated version of the pebbles material from earlier to make it seem as though extra things are collecting along the bottom of the wall. Speaking of the wall, it was time to create our background. I quickly came to the conclusion that if I wanted a background that looked pretty similar to the show, I would have to recreate a lot of it from scratch. Now, in the first couple of test renders that I did, this was the background that I used. It was created in Photoshop layering three different images together. I decided I did a pretty poor job, so I added some more wheat and some trees. It still didn't look right without the unique looking farm hut in the background. I did try hunting around online for one, but no luck there. And this was the best result I got trying to AI upscale it. Yeah, it was a job for Photoshop. Now it's a bit beyond the scope of this tutorial, but I used artistic interpretation to rebuild the hut piece by piece. It was then nice and high res to be put on our background image and some more wheat just to incorporate it. Then I brought it into the scene and you can see that I made it seamless so I have a bit more freedom to move the camera without seeing a seam on the background. I mixed the wall and the sand material together to make it look as though some sand was kicked up the bottom of the wall. I controlled this using a dirt texture node which works along concave or convex edge normals. To make it look a bit more random I used, you guessed it, another noise texture map and another gradient map to control the values of the noise texture. I then realized I needed to add the pinkish red finishing line on the ground so I cut out a strip from the ground plane and used a similar material setup to the wall and a dirt texture node to control a dusting of sand over the top of it. Delicious. The last thing I did was bring in the soldiers from Turbo Squid and link up their PBR texture maps. And they were pretty much good to go straight out of the box. And that is it. Our Squid Game 3D scene is complete. The only other thing I did which I'm not covering is set up the cameras and render out some animations. So there you have it. I hope you enjoyed watching this video and I hope you took something away from it. I did try to keep it short and digestible. With that being said, it is the first video I've ever done of this type. So if you think there's anything I could do better next time or improve on, do let me know and I'd be happy to answer any questions that you've got in the comments below. Other than that, take care, look after yourself and I'll see you in the next video, whenever that is. Okay, bye.